Psalm 120 to 134. And that's why these are called the Psalms of Ascent. Now, the women of the church in the Reformed Episcopal Church have put together a devotional this year on the Psalms of Ascent. Every year they put, they put together a different devotional. Uh, you don't have to be a woman to buy it if you're interested in looking at it and seeing the devotional on what it means to approach God and worship. It's only $4. If you'd like it, we're going to be ordering it in about two weeks. Uh, as many as people are interested in, and Stephanie will be ordering them. So please see Stephanie, let her know, even if you don't have the four dollars, just see it. And let her know, and we'll order it, and then we can pair when you get it. Okay? Um, I think that's all the announcements I have. Is there anything I missed? No. Great. So I hope to see you at the Summer Beach Jam. If you can make it, if not, see you next Sunday. Um, but actually, we're starting, not ending. So we'll continue opening our service singing hymn number 71.
and grant them this merciful God for his sake, that we may be raptured in the godly, righteous, and sober life. In the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. The Almighty and merciful God grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. As our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 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 hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Let us stand and sing together the Benite in your bowl.
my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great is a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, a reptile and sea creature, can be tamed, and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless, evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. If you would please rise <coughs> and sing that Magnificate Domino down on page four of our bulletin. Oh. Uh-huh. 
excited about, not because I don't need to hear it. Goodness knows, I need to hear this particular lesson. It's been uh, on my back for several days, especially now, how much I need to hear it. But I love preaching, like last week. Last week, we had the opportunity to look at Job and how, it's just one of those examples of the, the New Testament concealed from the Old Testament so wonderfully. And this week, we have something which is really heavy, which really speaks to me. And I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to say it probably speaks to me more than anybody else here. Uh, you can argue with me. Please do. <laughs> Please tell me that. But um, really, this is something I, I think we all strive to watch, and we all could strive to watch. They're just careless words which unintentionally, not necessarily even intentionally, are hurtful to others. Words have carelessly spoken and started riots, and revolutions. Uh, good words may start revivals and reformations, but I think a little less so. Careless words can lead to disasters. My boys hadn't heard this expression, but there's a famous poster in World War II. Loose lips sink ships. So a couple of you heard this before. What it means is this. You can't, basically, soldiers when they're home, you can't share anything about your deployment schedule, when you're going, where you're going, what you're going to do when you get there, just for fear someone might hear it, but shouldn't hear it. And it could cause a great deal of damage. Words can cause damage. The Royal Navy, a couple years ago, you may have seen this, they updated it. I'll actually put this one. I think I'm going to use this as my online cover. I always like to have a nice little picture online. But they updated it saying, loose tweets sink fleets. I thought that was cute. But it's the same principle. In fact, I think that's even more appropriate for us today. I was actually talking with Bill about this this week. Sorry to use you as an example, Bill. But I have this problem when I'm on the internet. It can be, I can see this and it can be so easy, especially when you're anonymous, when you're talking to someone who you've never met, who you never will meet, 
who have no idea what you are, to say the meanest, heartless things to them because you're frustrated with something they may have said on the internet. And one of the problems in writing emails is I've received emails, which I'm sure people haven't intended to be grumpy, but I've read with the grumpiest of all possible voices. And if you've ever done that, it's really easy to do. When you talk to people on the phone, it's a lot easier to hear inflection. But even regardless of that, we still say words, type words, tweet words. I don't tweet, but if I did, we would tweet words, which would be just hurtful to others. That's what we're looking at this morning. Anyway, with all these warnings, and, and I'm telling you, that lesson from James, that is a hard piece of work. Proverbs 17, 28, a wonderful, wonderful verse. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. You know, this is where I'm sure the basis of the, the popular saying, better to keep your mouth shut than be thought a fool, than to open it and remove all doubt. We've all heard that one, I'm sure, before. I can't tell you how many times I've said things I regret. I've said things that other people have overheard. And just even saying this now, I'm flashing back in my head to all these things that have proven not only um, mean or foolish, as the Bible says here, but petty and jealous and all sorts of things. Our lesson began with a warning to me, not so much you, but me. For pastors and teachers especially in how we talk to others. Uh, more important than ever that those who teach others use the filter God gave us, our brain, but there's a catch here. And sometimes you need to compare scripture to scripture. You take James and you take Paul and both of them have Beautiful discussions of how we should be talking to one another. James, you could say his discussion is, talk a lot less, and when you do, watch what you say. Paul is, not so much talk a lot less, but when you talk, edify, 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 build up, build up, encourage those who are around you. Put them together, it's, it's a really positive thing. Uh, we need to watch how much we talk, as well as what we say, and make sure that it's positive, too. But Paul also talks about the fruits of the Spirit. I'm going to come back to that. But one of the most important fruits is self-control. Verse 1, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, you can say, first of all, okay, that talk about the pastor, what, what, what I say from the pulpit, what I say in life to people, oh, that's, that's pastor talking. I've heard that a number of times, and that's been quite embarrassing. Um, here's the problem, and as especially we live in a culture, in a society where Bible-believing Christians are fewer and fewer, whether we want to be considered teachers and role models, we really don't have much of a choice. We really all are. We're all teachers, even if we don't want to be. When we say we're Christians, and the world watches us and follows us, they do it to judge us. So we're not talking here only about God judging us, but the world constantly judging us. And they do this for a reason. They judge us harshly because we claim to be following Christ. Now, James points out you know, how they love to judge pastors and church leaders a little stronger. And you'll see on the news how if some pastor does something, they'll broadcast it on the news, even if, if some other random person did it who wasn't a pastor. It never would make the news in 100 years. Pastor does it. They want to put that on the news so everyone can see why. What 
is the reason behind it. Because they want an excuse not to follow Christ. That's the easy bottom line. As Christians, every negative act which we perform, every negative word which we speak, is amplified out into the world so that they can justify their unbelief. They want to hear it so they can feel better about rejecting Christ. So our responsibility to speak wisely begins with the idea that when we speak, they're not looking at us fallen sinners. They're looking at Christ speaking through us. That especially goes, of course, to pastors and teachers. Paul then, excuse me, James then, goes into some wonderful illustrations here. I love all of these. Uh, talking about the tongue and kind of metaphorically. The tongue, when you consider it, it's only two ounces. That's kind of small. But that little tiny two ounces receives more exercise than any other muscle in the body. Let me think about it. It's constantly wagging. Our words, of course, can encourage others, but just as easily they can hurt others without any intention of doing it. And sadly, I can say at least for myself, I do this far more than I want to or intend to. And sometimes it's really easy to not want to apologize when you didn't mean to offend somebody, and yet the words that came out of your mouth really hurt the feelings. But I'm sure somebody here might be able to associate with that. I, I didn't say it in a bad way. I didn't mean it negatively. And yet they took it negatively, and it hurt. That's when we really have to realize my words are important. And what I do now, representing Christ, is important. I'm sure all of us have been on the receiving end of words which have influenced us to not want to do something anymore that we had thought of trying to do or wanting to do, maybe even to serve in the church. But then we kind of gave up because we felt, I'm not going to be good enough because somebody said, are they really good enough? So James gives us two wonderful illustrations about how our tongue gives direction, and then two wonderful illustrations about how deadly our tongue is. We're going to look at the first two, how our tongue gives direction. And he gives us the image of a horse and a rudder. Um, he compares the ability to control our tongue to a bridle in the mouth of a horse. Now, my dad grew up across the street from Pimlico Racetrack when he grew up. He loved going to the racetrack. He took me from as far back as I remember, uh, you know, sometimes even once a week to the racetrack when I was really young. And one of my very first memories, in fact, was watching, and somebody here, somebody, a couple people in the service, first service remember this, in 1973, watching Secretariat run the Triple Crown, and Secretariat was this horse, which is uh, 1,150 pounds in size, and this tiny little jockey, 80 pounds, sits on top of it. And this tiny little 80 pound jockey is controlling this giant monster of muscle and making it go wherever he wants it to go and making it increase its speed. And its greatest instrument is the tiny little piece of metal the size of your tongue. And that is what controls it. And James says, this is just like us. Our tongue leads us. And it can take us in good directions, it can take us in bad directions. And more often than not, the more we use it, the more it's gonna lead us into bad directions. He also likens it to a ship's rudder. A rudder can make up maybe one to two percent the size of the ship, but is so important in leading that ship where to go. I read uh, yesterday 
the Army has this one tugboat, if you can picture this. A tiny tugboat that can pull an aircraft carrier around. If you've ever seen an aircraft carrier, you'll know how big that is and how amazing this would be to see a tugboat pulling an aircraft carrier, steering it, making it go where it wants it to go. And what controls where it goes? A tiny little rudder about six feet, eight square feet in size. It controls this giant aircraft carrier. And that's like our tongue again. Our tongue controls so much more than we give it credit for. Then he compares it to a fire, setting first a tiny spark, setting a forest on fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. And this is verse six, I'm sorry. The tongue set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Wow. Uh, yeah. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature to be tamed, and has been tamed by man, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless, evil, and full of deadly poison. We, we can tame it, we can tame an elephant. Climb on the back of an elephant, put a big thing, one of those big saddle things, and just ride around on it. But we can't control this tiny little tongue. It says a lot about us. But first, he compares it to a fire. That's a wonderful illustration. Um, see on the news a lot about the California fires, and California loses about 4,000 square miles of land a year to wildfires which can be set by something as small as a cigarette that's thrown to the ground and not stomped out properly. That can cause a huge forest fire. But that's nothing compared if you have, haven't noticed what's going on in Australia. In that country slash continent, they have lost over the last year and a half, two years, 73,000 miles of land due to fires, 15,000 different wildfires, 3 billion animals have died in these fires there. And they can start by something tiny, a tiny little spark can have so much destruction. What, what's, what's Mike say? So and so should be tougher. Why, why are they so easily pushed around, especially when they didn't mean it? And that's what James is talking about. Our words matter. And especially if you realize that's other people, that's not ourselves, right? When it's said to us, then it, then it kind of matters. And teenagers, especially the sleepy one up here in the front row, they tend to be even especially more susceptible to it. Uh, this is boy number four here. He really is asleep. Oh, well. Uh, this is boy number four here. I thought it was just going to get him to wake up, but no, uh, he's gone. Um, boy number four, just like the others, so uh, hi, so easily susceptible to my words, uh, which I don't intend to be hurtful, but can just simply be crushing. And that's with teenagers because they got all the crazy chemicals that have suddenly gotten in their body. I haven't had any girls, and I think that's probably a good thing, as careless as I can be with my words, I think I'd have been even worse if I had girls. Uh, words, we don't think, these are serious words, but to them they are. Words are more potent than the careless way that we throw them out. So James, he calls the tongue a restless evil, and I like the image you compare it to having restless leg syndrome. Dave has restless leg syndrome, and I do too. Neither of us can hold our legs steady. I'm standing up here and pacing back and forth, so I can keep still by remembering to move my toes. Um, we gotta keep moving our tongues. And if we stop moving our tongues, something's wrong. That's what a lot of people have a problem with. 
Your tongue doesn't need to keep moving. Our mouth, especially, as James says, is full of poison. You can consider your mouth is, is like carrying vials of anthrax around. What we say can be deadly, but we don't treat it that way. No human being, James says, can tame the tongue either. Did you catch that? This is where it really gets good. This is where we can get some good application out of our message today. So that means we shouldn't bother, right? Well, if I can't tame my tongue, I shouldn't bother to tame it. No, because we don't rely on our human nature to tame the tongue. That's the important thing. What do we rely on? We rely on the Holy Spirit. And as I said, the fruits of the Spirit that God has given us, and especially the gift of self-control, one of the, the least popular of the gifts one of the most essential. Um, verses 9 through 12, let me read them again for us. With our tongues, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Let's stop and think about that. I think that's, that's an amazing comparison. Um, it's a lot like John. How can you say you love your brother? How can you say you love God when you hate your brother who's with you? How can you praise God with your tongue and curse people who are made in God's image? From the same mouth come blessing and curse. My brothers, these things ought not to be. I just love how he phrases that. Does the spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh water and salt water. Or there could also be bitter waters. Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond produce fresh water. What does our transformation look like? And that's helpful. St. Paul tells us what are these fruits of the Spirit that are supposed to be evident in us? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It's a good, good passage to memorize. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we follow the flesh, we're speaking without several of them, including love and self-control. If the Holy Spirit is guarding our mouths, we have self-control and we're speaking with love. Brings us, and this, this is probably a, a nice saying, maybe you can remember this as uh, something to, to guard your mouth. It's an old saying. What's down in the well comes up in the bucket. We had a book about 10 years ago with that title. What you speak shows what's down in the well, what's in your heart. If the Holy Spirit is there, if he is unquenched, then what should be coming up should be things of praise, not just simply for God, but for those who are around us, encouragement, blessing. Um, if we quench the Holy Spirit, then of course it's going to be something very different. Jesus addresses it this way when he's addressing the Jewish leaders. In Matthew 13, 34 to 36, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. What's down in the well, comes up, in the bucket comes up. We know what's inside us when we hear what we say. Self-control is an essential fruit of the Spirit in our lives. It is as important as any other fruit of the Spirit. It's the one, of course, we often hear the most excuses about. You know, uh, come on, uh, and I shouldn't, I almost said step. Because it sounds like an excuse I would make. Come on, Steph, you know I'm just being sarcastic. That's just, you know, that's just me. Uh, I probably said that about a thousand times. 
Uh, we like to say that, and it's, it's not godly at all. Um, that's who I was, not who I'm supposed to be. Who am I? Am, am I the old man, or should I be the new man? Do I reflect Adam or Christ? When they look at me, when they look at us, do they see God reflected in how we talk and share? Yeah, you know, that, that may be the way we think we are, but that's not necessarily the way we should be. We are supposed to, the world, exemplify Christ to the world and to one another here. So I would challenge you to take, take some time maybe this week, reflect on James chapter 3, and identify what you're saying, how you are using the gift, not your own strength, but the spiritual gift of self-control given to us by God through his Holy Spirit in our hearts to choose carefully the things that we are saying to encourage and teach and inspire and others both in the church and out in the world God's love. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the great love you have for us. For the great word you have spoken to us through the scriptures. We pray, Lord, that you will open our hearts to what we speak to one another and what we speak to the world may be glorifying to you that we may show forth Christ to those who see us and hear us. This we beg through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our reflective pen is 93. <laughs>
Bless this offering that it may be used for the building up of your church through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our service continues at the bottom of page five in your book. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, from whom all good things do come, grant to us, your humble servants, that by your holy inspiration we may think those things that are good, and by your merciful guiding may perform the same. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Together, O Lord God of infinite mercy, we humbly beg thee to look down with pity upon the nation now engaged in war. Look in compassion on those immediately exposed to peril, conflict, sickness, and death. Comfort the prisoners, relieve the suffering of the wounded, and show mercy to the dying. Tenderly regard those who live at home, fear, deprivation, and sorrow. Remove the your goodness and honors all causes and occasions of the Lord, and of your great enemies, restore peace from all the nations. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to your merciful care, that being guided by your providence, we may dwell secure in your peace. Grant to Joe Biden, the President of the United States, and to all in authority, wisdom and strength to know and to do your will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness, and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in your fear. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, the strong tower and refuge of your people, we entreat your favor upon the officers and all who are and have been enlisted in the service of defense of our country. Spare them from being ordered into a war of aggression or oppression. Use them, if need be, as your instrument in the defense of our national life and liberty. Watch over also all police and law enforcement officers everywhere. Protect them from harm and the performance of their duties. We pray also for firefighters, first responders, and healthcare workers, and all who protect us and ours from all types of danger. Give them the courage and skill to carry out their duties well and safely. Where they must go into the face of danger, be by their side. Watch over their families, reminding them that those who go into danger are of your loving care. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect thing, send down upon our bishops, especially Foley, Ray, and Chuck. Pray for Pastor Mike, Reguardo Andrate, the Good Shepherd Church, for Mark Speck and Grace Church and all other clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge and helpful spirit of your grace. And that they may truly please you for upon them the continual dew of your blessing. This morning we fresh, especially pray for the ministry of Trans World Radio and their outreach to Christians in the third world and for non-Christians who need to hear your gospel, especially in countries that have no other way to hear your word. We pray for Atlantic Christian School. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, for Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beg you for all sorts and conditions of men, that you would be pleased to make your ways known unto them, your saving help unto all nations. More especially, we pray for your Holy Church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by your good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith and unity of spirit, and the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. 
Finally, we commend your fatherly goodness, all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, especially those for whom our prayers are desired. We pray for Volodymyr Zelensky and the people of Ukraine, for Margie, Paul, Pastor Frank, who's now home from successful shoulder surgery, for Tony, Al, Dominic, Marion, Destiny, George, Pat, Larry and Debbie, the McQuaid and Casanova's families, Rosemary, Margaret, Crystal, Mildred, for Heather, Michelle, Sabrina, for Frank's family, for Pastor Jack, Clark, for Isabel, for Erica's family, for Barbara, and for those Lord who are upon our hearts, that it may please you to comfort and relieve them according to their sober necessities, giving them patience under their suffering, and the happy issue out of all their afflictions. This we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we are up here to serve, give you humble and hearty thanks. Draw your goodness to the mother of God, and us as well. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, all for our conviction of love, and the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of all your mercies, that our hearts may be truly thankful. And then we pray Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, through the communion of the Holy Spirit, we all are in glory, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, you have promised to hear the petitions of those who ask in your Son's name. Mercifully accept us who have now made our prayers and petitions to you, and grant us those things which we have asked in faith, according to your will, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, be with us all and Amen. Our closing hymn is number 68.
all God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.